Welcome everyone. I am Joy Huang, one of the V from Top student leaders. On behalf of our team, thank you for joining us today. We hope that you find this conversation important and relevant. Thank you, Joy. Uh, so welcome everyone to View from the Top. Today, I have the pleasure of introducing Priscilla Chan, the co-founder and the co-CEO of the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative. Uh, Priscilla and her husband, Mark, founded CZI in 2015 to leverage technology, community-driven solutions, and collaboration to help solve some of the world's toughest challenges. She is a physician, an educator, and a philanthropist who approaches philanthropy and indeed everything with rigor, data, and curiosity. And really looking forward to learning more from Priscilla and hearing about what's on her mind and the things she is thinking about today in her conversation with Rex Woodbury, MBA 2021. So thank you again, Priscilla, for joining us and really looking forward to the discussion. Priscilla, thank you so much for being here. Hey, it's good to be here, here. Here, virtually. Um, well, it's been an emotional week with the Chauvin trial, with ongoing police shootings, with gun violence, but I want to say I've personally been so inspired by the work that you're doing at the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative on education and racial equity and, and criminal justice reform. And I'm thrilled to be having this conversation, and I know that my classmates are thrilled to, to be here listening to you today. Yeah, thanks for making up, uh, doing the work and putting this together. Um, and I have to say in this past week, I, I was just a huge mixed bag of emotions, like relief um, for the verdict uh, in the murder of George Floyd and what like in just like sadness that it had to happen, that it happened this way. And, mm -hmm. um, but also hope, always hope um, mm -hmm. that we're gonna do better. Yeah, I mean, I, I want to talk specifically in a little bit about some of the initiatives that you're working on, which I think touch on all of those, um, you know, aspects or values that you just mentioned. But I do want to start with your family, because you have a very incredible family story. You're the daughter of Chinese Vietnamese refugees. Your grandparents were business people in Vietnam who worked at canning pineapple and, and making paper and running a restaurant. And I was wondering if you could share with us the story of how your family left Vietnam and came to America. Um, so this happened before my time. Um, my grandparents were business partners. Um, my, um, my dad's parents um, it had six kids and my mom's parents had, um, my mom's dad actually had two wives and um, a really interesting part of my family history that's a, a, that I just want to name is my mom's mom was a second wife and she was, she was an indentured servant um, who was uh, brought into the family to have more kids. Um, and so my, uh, between the mix of those two really um, large and eclectic families, um, my grandparents were business partners. And when the war was getting to be a pretty dark place, um, they decided to smuggle their children out. And um, the, they were gonna become, send their kids in boats. And in the United States, they were known as boat people. But the way they made their journey as boat people was incredibly, um, it's just real. Um, there were stories of boats sinking and people dying on the boats. And so my grandparents decided that they didn't want a single boat to sink with all their children. So what they did, and, and you know, the unstated next step is that they would lose all their children. What they did is they paired up their children into twos or threes so that they would have company on the journey. Um, but if any boat went down, they, they would only lose one to two children. And that's how my grandparents said goodbye to their kids on these little boats in the middle of the night, um, sending them off into the South China Sea in hopes that they'll see each other again. And I hold on, obviously I wasn't there, but I hold on to that image and sort of moment of like how big a decision um, parents, people make for their families, for their livelihoods, and um, the immense amount of optimism 
that, and faith that you have to have in order to make that decision. Um, I, 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 I like to believe that that's somehow genetic and I've inherited it. Um, and, but that's sort of what I always come back to. Like, we, there has to be better and we will get there. Um, and then long story short, um, my both, everyone made it. Um, and it took about a decade for everyone to get back together. Uh, but, and then my parents, you know, they stayed together for longer than the boat ride. And here I am. It's an incredible story. And you've said that, you know, I, I'd love to hear if you're open to speaking about it, those early kind of years in, I think it was suburban, you know, Massachusetts, kind of outside of the Boston area, you know, your family's building a home there. And, and you've said that you were bullied when you were younger and kind of put your head down and, and worked really hard and then, you know, got into Harvard. And if you're open, I'd love to hear about, you know, how that early experience of being bullied or growing up in that environment shaped you. And then that transition moment, I imagine it was quite a, a shock going from that family life to, to the world of Harvard when you were 18. Yeah, so um, we were sponsored it, at the time, uh, refugees were sponsored um, by all different groups and uh, the Catholic church played a really big role. Um, and we were sponsored by the Catholic church, my family was. And so we ended up in an Irish Catholic town outside of Boston. And we were the first to arrive and which otherwise was just like straight up goodwill hunting with like, you know, Ben Affleck and Matt Damon as my neighbors. Um, so I did not fit in, believe it or not. Um, and it was, it, I, um, I, there's so many reasons why I didn't fit in, but I remember, um, I remember thinking that I don't know what's out there, but there has to be more. And if I work really hard, I will get there. And, there, and I remember the day I made that decision. Um, I, was, I was being bullied in middle school. Middle school is awful. Thank God we're all not in middle school anymore. It really is. It really is. Yeah. Um, and I was eating lunch in the bathroom, in a public school bathroom, because I didn't want to go out to um, the playground, um, the blacktop after after lunch. And I was just like, this can't be the rest of my life, right? Like there's gotta be more. And so like, I, I remember as a sixth grader, I was like, I'm gonna buckle down. I'm, I don't know what's out there. I'm gonna work really hard and I'm gonna get there. Um, so I, I spent a lot of time chasing that dream. And then I got into Harvard, which was a little bit confusing because, um, you know, if my parents didn't go to college, my parents didn't really speak English. And like Harvard was like an idea, but it was, it was unclear how attainable or unattainable it was. You know, it was like, a, we, we didn't have access to anything. So maybe this was just like normal and accessible, not like sort of out of this world and accessible. So like, I didn't know how to parse the, um, the idea of going there or or I at least didn't get nervous enough in time. Um, I got there and I was like, holy cow. These people, like, first of all, uh, like as an outsider going to Harvard, everyone dresses the same. Um, everyone's wearing the same clothes. Everyone's talking about the same places. And I've never been there. And I definitely don't, I don't even know where to get clothes that look like that. And I was also no longer a big fish in a little pond. And I was incredibly um, feeling like a failure, feeling like a fraud. And um, the turning point was realizing that I wasn't the only one. I joined the service house at Harvard where I was a part of the Phillips Brooks house. And there were other people who had stories like mine and there were people uh, and they were giving back. And I wanted to do that too. And that's been my mission ever since. Um, mm -hmm. But the most important thing that I learned in that moment that I try to hold on to always is that if you hide, you're powerless. If you hide in the bathroom, if you hide behind sort of who you, know, who you think you should be, you are powerless. But if you mm -hmm. name what's hard, if you name why you're different, if you name your story, that gives you power. 
And so I've always um, tried to be upfront about who I am and sort of name my experience, name what I'm feeling, um, because um, when you when you when you're not hiding, you can be your best self. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure if it was when you were at Harvard or, or later when you were a volunteer or educator or doctor, but you've talked about a moment when you realized that the problems were bigger, bigger than you, bigger than you thought that the structure and the system was broken. And I think, you know, I'm sure that resonates with a lot of our classmates when you step back and kind of realize that you have to be part of the solution or you have to get involved. And I'm curious, can you talk about when that moment hit for you and how, how formative that was in realizing that you actually needed to start a sort of step one, you know, build the new system or, or at least have a part in that. Yeah, um, it's a terrifying moment. Um, and one where I will, uh, in, the, in the spirit of naming things is I failed. Um, I was taking care of an eight-year-old little boy in my practice at San Francisco General Hospital. And I'd been taking care of, for, of him for like two or three years. And I was like, there's some, what's like, it was confusing because his mom kept telling me he had seizures. And I was like, I don't think he has seizures. Like I looked everything up, he doesn't have seizures. And I, I kind of like, and then I was like, maybe there's something developmentally going wrong and like with the school. And I've been trying to get in touch with the school, but the school hours somehow didn't match up with my um, clinic hours. And we couldn't get like, the only way to get information between like the school and me was like, a piece of paper that we were having mom bring back and forth. And so like, we're, we're kind of stuck like this for a few years. And then I realized he was eight, that there had been a giant miscommunication, that mom had been telling the school that he had a seizure disorder and he had missed, he was eight, so third grade, by third grade, he had missed 180 days of school, which is one school year, because he, the school had excused all this for his medical issue, which was presumed to be a seizure disorder. And they were doing, they were trying to do what was best for the kid. And meanwhile, I was like, no, no seizure disorder. He should be in school. And um, after we sort of like had an emergency series of meetings, we realized that he had been witness to very severe domestic violence at home. And he was acting out in a way that looked like seizures, but weren't. And so in that series of miscommunications, he had missed exactly what he needed, a safe environment that understood his needs holistically. And instead he had missed a full year of school. And he, as an eight-year-old, didn't know his letters, couldn't read, struggled with numbers. And when we tested him, he was of a normal intelligence. Like big time fail. And the teacher and principal thought that they were doing exactly the right thing and for this kid. I thought I was advocating for the kid as someone who like always asks about school, how things were going. And so we had a collision of people who were trying their best and that the, the way we structure, the way we care for our most vulnerable is completely broken. And we just completely missed the mark. And then I was like panicked because I'm like, well, I gotta tell someone. Like someone needs to know that there's a big problem. And I'm sure many of you uh, like are very good at you know, identifying problems and like going to sort of going to the authorities. The only problem is eventually you'll find that there is no authority and that no, you're the grown up in the room. You're, you're the only one who cares enough about this problem to do something about it. And, and so I spent a good six months. I was like, if I do enough research, I'll find a way that this problem has been solved. Or if I do enough this, I'll find the solution. And I realized that it just, it didn't exist. And um, and when you confront that moment, you have to think like, well, what am I going to do about it now? Um, and so that's sort of what led me down the road of eventually um, starting the primary school where we, um, I started a school in um, a fit of insanity at the same time of having a child and starting CZI. 
Um, it's doing great now, uh, but they really work on sort of knitting, changing the way the system works, knitting together um, healthcare, especially those um, in our safety nets and um, the school environment. Mm -hmm. I mean, what's so interesting to me about your sort of two lives or multiple lives here of, of being a doctor and, you know, some of this is coming from my own, my brother's a doctor and I think he and I talk a lot about depth of impact versus breadth of impact. And you've spoken about what you say, you call it the trolley problem of, you know, would you rather help a hundred people deeply or, you know, help everyone a little bit? And, you know, this will lead us, I'm sure, into talking about CZI, but I'm curious in your career, as you evolve through different chapters, how have you thought about balancing depth of impact and breadth of impact? I've gone through all different versions of this. Um, and I think a couple things here. One is in order to make the, uh, let's see, which one are you calling depth and breadth? Is your, is your brother taking care of a single patient depth in your breadth? Like how I would you say, I would say, and maybe this resonates with some business school classmates. I would say my brother subscribes to the philosophy. If he helps one patient very deeply in his career, I think he views it as a success and he's fulfilled. Whereas I think, you know, somewhere along the road, and this is probably true of many GSB students, you know, we think much more about breath, you know, let's scale this business, let's grow the system, let's, and I'm always telling my brother, I'm saying, Carson, you know, think big, you know, fix the structural issues of healthcare. And, and maybe it's a different sort of personal fulfillment of where you get fulfillment from. Um, but I think, I think of medicine as depth of impact and maybe business or fixing the structure as, as breath. Okay, good. Um, that's, I have the same definition, um, but I will argue that you actually, not every person needs to do both. People naturally gravitate to one or another, but to really make change, you need to understand both. Um, and um, because in order to actually change the, you know, we'll, we'll take the change the system seat. You need to actually understand what the problems are. And you know what your brother really understands, what Carson really, really understands is what are the barriers that made it hard for this patient to, to get to access care or what made it hard for them to remember to take their meds every day. Like as a good doctor, he knows that and he has an intuition for it. And um, it's oftentimes surprising. Um, the bus schedule used to determine and whether or not the, you know, art was running on time used to determine whether or not my patients would get to clinic and whether or not my clinic would run smoothly. So it wasn't going to be some sort of change management process in the way we check patients in. It's like BART is screwing over my clinic schedule. And so it's in, I, you have to understand and have a clear vision of what the actual issues are, the real barriers that affect the lives of the people we want to impact in order to impact with breath. Um, and so at CZI, we hold that as a core value um, and we call it staying close to the work. We have to be proximate to understand how to make systemic change. Um, and that's what we, we intentionally hire people with both. And I can tell you that there are disagreements and I'm sure we can name many and sort of just like language and orientation barriers around um, when you bring such different people of all different backgrounds, all different orientations around the work to solve a problem together. But that's when you actually understand with clarity what you're trying to do. And um, like you, then you can scale something meaningful, something good in the world. Mm -hmm. But on a personal to... note, I plan on going back to a fellowship when I'm done um, with my, my run at CZI. So I am someone who loves, loves being with kids and families. I still, I, I, I mentor kids, little kids over Zoom and at the school. I love that. I need mm -hmm. that to nourish my soul, but I have to say the sy systemic work is what gives me hope. Um, mm -hmm. And that's why a lot of, um, you know, to use your brother again, as an example, you like, it's amazing being on the front lines and that's incredibly gratifying. But if you run into the same problem for the hundredth or thousandth time, you can lose hope. And so it's mm -hmm. the work in changing the systems that gives me hope in that work. Mm -hmm.
Well, it's good to know that you can have, you can do both. You can have different chapters and reinvent yourself in, in different chapters of life and career. But I do want to talk about the systemic stuff and, and, and CZI specifically, the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative. I've heard you say that, you know, I think you started it the same year that you had your daughter, Max. And uh, I've heard you say being a new parent and starting a philanthropic organization are similar. So I'm curious what you mean by that. Oh, man. Um, uh, uh, uh. <laughs> keep you up at night. Um, all the, it's lots of sleepless nights for different reasons. It's either the baby or, uh, or building an organization. And I think the core of it though, is what I mean is when you guys all go out there and contribute to organizations of all different phases um, and stages, it's, I'll use a, a pediatrician term, is like, is it developmentally appropriate? Um, and uh, you talk to people, all organizations have sort of goofy things about them and things that they're working through. And, but some problems are developmentally appropriate for the stage of the organization. And some aren't. Um, and uh, when you, when you're, you know, up at night wondering, like, is Max okay? Like, is, is she, is she smiling? Well, and you're Googling, like, for the parents in the room, like, you're Googling, like, smiling at five weeks okay like there's a similar version of what happens when you build an organization like is it okay that like we you know there have been moments at cci where we had our internet cut off because we forgot to pay the internet bill um and that was okay at like week eight but it is not okay at year five and so um, I think just understanding sort of the cadence and evolution and growth of an organization and giving yourself some slack when you're like, oh, it's okay. This is like, this is a problem that many organizations have. We'll get to it. And like solving the right ones at the right moment in time for the organization. Mm -hmm. And you stepped away from medicine to run, to be co-CEO of, of CCI and I think one journalist wrote about you. She's a doctor that has become a crusader. And I'm curious, what is a trait from your medicine days that you've carried with you that's been surprisingly helpful in running CZI? And what's what's sort of something you've had to learn that new? Um, let's see. I um, love being a student. Um, so I don't know if that's a crusader, but I will trade seats and, and just soak in knowledge at any moment. Um, but I think the same thing that brought me to education, to medicine, and now to CZI is that these are people's lives we're touching. Um, and there's, a, you know, you can track metrics, you can think about sort of, um, sort of dollars and impact and um, uh, all different ways that you can quantify, but at the end of the day, um, we're touching people's lives and people's lives are complex. Um, they, uh, we need to see the whole picture um, and we can't forget that. And when I think about this, the patient that I told, just told you about, or many of, I have many, a catalog of faces that's sort of like, it's get me going better than coffee every morning. Um, I, um, I can't stop because I have to do better. And um, there's, no, there's no choice to give up. I can fail and I fail all the time, but I can't stop because it's not, an, uh, an intellectual idea that I'm pursuing. I'm trying to actually touch and change people's lives at the end of my time. And so um, quitting's not really an option. Mm -hmm. um, let's see, things that I learned new. Um, oh, I could like, honestly, at one point I was like, I should go to business school. I don't know anything <laughs> about, I'm like, what is HR? Because remember, I think there's some, a few MDs in the room. like. HR, nobody's ever cared about me. Nobody's ever told me like that, like they can, like, you know, I've been yelled at in the middle, like, like there are people that are supposed to take care of me. That's cool. So learning about HR, learning about operational management, 
Gantt charts are a thing, like, and make mm -hmm. things run smoothly, I think. I'm just saying mm -hmm. words that I've heard that now other people help me do. Um, but, you know, being uh, smart about the way um, you prioritize, run projects, um, and get people, convince people that you have a mission worth pursuing. Mm -hmm. I think we're seeing this bleeding. I mean, social impact business at Stanford, you know, our social innovation is important to a lot of students and it's a, it's a big focus of the curriculum. But I think we're seeing bleeding lines between the two. And I was really moved by your letter to your grant partners from a couple of weeks back about the attacks on Asian Americans and how it personally resonated with you and, and your grandparents' story. And I'm curious if you could speak about you know, what that emotional, um, you know, time for you, but also from a business perspective, what are ways that leaders can, can get involved and can take issues and actions on, on those different problems? Yeah, I have to, I have to be honest. Um, I had to take a step back and do some learning and reflection when this all happened, because in sort of my experience growing up, in a, uh, a, one of the only um, Asian American families in our community. And then going to Harvard where, you know, being really involved in social justice and often in our country, that's about black and Latinx and the historically underserved populations. I, I, that's been my calling. And I relate because I'm like, I get it. I'm an immigrant. I've been an outsider. Like I identify with the issues that you face. And I've never, until recently, never really taken a moment to reflect on my my own racial identity, um, because I, I sort of just always assumed one that it was an anomaly, um, mm. and two, um, and this is probably the result of being raised by refugees. Just put your head down; it's going to be fine. Like, just take what you can get and like keep going, and you'll be fine. And it, the interesting impact is it made it easier for me to advocate for others than it was to advocate for myself. And this is not a new phenomenon. Um, it's well studied and well documented that also like, for instance, women can advocate very well for other women and struggle for, with advocating for themselves. And um, the, so I did some reflection. There's a five part PBS series that's excellent on, called Asian Americans. Um, I highly recommend it. And starting to really think about like how to, to make sure that we're not always forgetting the Asian American, the AAPI community when we talk about people of color, because they are people of color that have very complex relationships with race and other, uh, in, uh, their own race, other minorities in our country. And, um, and we, we need to examine it collectively. And I have to say, I've spoken to many Asian American leaders in, in the wake of the shootings and they, they, it's a very similar story. They're like, oh yeah, I, I gotta wake up to this. And so I would say for others in the business community is understanding like, like do some learning um, and um, also, Think about how um, just because a group doesn't speak up doesn't mean that there aren't needs, um, because this is a group that's historically in our country um, for one reason or another, um, not trained to speak up for many reasons. Mm -hmm. Priscilla, I have one more question for you before we hear from two students. And I wanna go back to your grandparents and parents coming to America on the boat from Saigon. And you know, you've spoken about them, you've spoken about your own kids. What's one important lesson, you know, if you had to pick one lesson that your parents, grandparents that you've taken from them that you wanna teach your own kids, what would that be? Um, so the optimism that I was, jo uh, I hope it's in me, I, um, I want them to feel um, that optimism too. And not a Pollyanna type of optimism, but a faith 
that people will continue, like things will, if we work hard and we continue the fight, things will improve. Um, and to always believe that there has to be better. Um, gratitude. And this one's going to be, I, you know, I grew up as a child of people who were uh, politically persecuted, refugees on boats, just like, just grateful for every day. Um, and the last one is um, sometimes, for many reasons, not seen as a very popular sentiment, but I love our country. And, you know, it's popular to, you know, sometimes like you know, one side of the political spectrum gets to love our country or, you know, there's so many things broken that, you know, how can you love the United States of America? We, it's this, this country is founded on strong ideals that are not perfect but it is our responsibility to build a better country. And if you don't love it and you don't nourish it, it cannot live up to its potential. Gosh, I didn't realize I was so patriotic until just now. <laughs> <laughs> That's great, thank you. Well, I, I do have actually one more. I know I said that was last one. I have one more question for you, but first we're gonna hear from two of our students and I wanna make sure we have time for them. I, I think first up is Jessica. So we'll hear from Jessica now. Hi Priscilla, thanks for being here today and sharing your wisdom with all of us. Um, my question is around the huge health disparities we've seen, especially during this pandemic. You know, as a doctor and as a philanthropist, how do you think um, we can solve some of the health inequities in this country? I think it is important to realize that uh, related to the sort of understand the problem that you're trying to solve is that everyone has different barriers. And there's not a one size fits all. And there we have to take a community centric approach to addressing health disparities. Um, we, uh, we, we very early on in COVID, we ran a study on um, the prevalence of coronavirus in one census track in the mission. And what we realized, um, uh, Diane uh, Havler did this in, from UCSF, is that in this one census track, zero people of Caucasian descent had coronavirus. And um, I think it was near 20% of individuals with a Latinx background had coronavirus during this period that they were doing the test. And uh, first of all, that um, naming the disparity that you named, and the two groups had different access and different barriers to actually accessing testing and accessing care. And um, what that group then did was partner with the community. They partnered with the Latino task force and said, like, what is the best way to get tested? What is the best way to follow up? Um, and, under, and because it was such a deep partnership, the testing and treatment and now vaccination of that community is incredibly strong. And we sort of spread those learning across the city. But you know, the same thing that would have worked for, honestly, I had a colleague who fell into the census track who would have worked for David doesn't work for someone else um, who has an entirely set, different set of life circumstances. And so um, it's not about scaling what work sometimes can work for you or I, it's about working deeply with the community to understand like name, help us name the solution together. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica. Next, we have a question from Mary Grace. Hi, Priscilla. My name is Mary Grace Reeves. I'm in my fifth year of Stanford's dual MD MBA program, and I'm looking forward to starting residency this summer. And it's such a privilege to hear you speak. Thank you for being with us. I'm wondering, in founding and leading the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, you're tackling the most pressing societal challenges of our time. And through that process, what have you learned about building a successful team? And how has that allowed your team at CZI to navigate diverse initiatives? You know, building, I think building a good team is sort of, it, it's, it's, I, I wouldn't say it's specific to our work at uh, CZI, but it's naming things, being clear about what problem you're trying to solve, prioritizing it, and being really direct with other people um, when things are working or when they're not working. Um, 
and I will, I will name, I've fallen into the same traps. Like, uh, I don't want to say it. It like might hurt their feelings. I don't want to be mean. And, you know, I realized along the way, like, look, I am who I am, but like they're and they're going to like me or they're not. But like, I do know that people like to be successful and the way I make them successful is I tell them I'm as clear as I can with what I want to see and what feedback I have. And so um, that's, 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 I, I have to say not specific to our work at CZI, but just like, say it like it is Mary Grace. Thank you. Thank you, Mary Grace. Priscilla, I have one last question for you, which is actually a question that we're asking to all of our speakers this year. And it is, what are the principles that you rely on when you're facing the toughest moments as a leader? Um, in my toughest moments, I, I, those, the pictures of the kids that I've served and I've had successes and failures with, I keep them in my mind. Um, and I remember that, I remember those lessons. Like I have to, like, how would I solve this problem for him or for her um, and like build up from the community. Like I was just say, uh, uh, saying earlier, like try to understand the context that people's lives are in and solve from there. Um, and that co collaboration is key. Um, not one pro person has understands the solution fully and not one person can see, uh, not one person, no one sees the problem and no one sees the whole solution. But if we come together with different tools, different skill sets, we can solve this together. Um, and that's those are the two bits. And that it, this is also it's it's a lifetime of work. And so you got to break it down into little pieces. And um, like uh, the only way to eat an elephant is one bite at a time. And say I've heard that phrase, but that's what I'm going to take away. I didn't with... invent that. I think okay. that's either Desmond Tutu or Mandela. Love that. Well, thank you so much, Priscilla. I, I think I speak for everyone when you know we're inspired by your story, by what you're doing at Chan Zuckerberg, by um, you know the different lives and chapters that you've had, and and how you live um, with values and and with those principles. So, thank you so much for your time. We hope to have you back, hopefully in person, one time soon. Um, but thank you for joining us virtually. Yeah. Thanks for having me next year in person. Absolutely.